So I remember Jim coming across your Instagram feed and obviously activist anglers. And at the time I'd been thinking about, we need a, a salmon podcast. We need one looking at the plight of the Atlantic salmon, looking at it not from a fishing point of view, not from a pure environmental point of view, but something that crossed the bridge. And then of course came across your feed and I sent you a DM and the rest is history that you've regretted ever since. I rue the day that I opened that DM, Dara. It's my life has never been the same since. When you propose the idea of, of hosting or co-hosting a podcast, filling in the gaps, if you like, that you and I both felt were missing when it came to podcast discussions about salmon, and in particular, the hope um, and the solutions that are still potentially on offer, uh, I jumped at the chance, absolutely. So who are we going to hear from on this podcast series? Well, we have a whole plethora of guests. We managed to strong arm, we managed to cajole, we managed to press gank um, a, a wide spectrum of people to come on our show. We have uh, revered scientists like Ken Whelan, Phil McGinty, Glenn Nolan, and we have a whole gamut of, of activists, advocates, and professional anglers such as Alex Morton, Mikhail Froden, Yvonne Chouinard, Charles Clover, Paul Whitehouse, John Bailey, Dominic West, Matt Harris, to name but a few. They're all there. The incredible thing actually about that list, I think, Jim, is you have everybody from the billionaire founder of Patagonia, Yvonne, to activists, to anglers, to scientists. Every time we reached out, they said no problem. They wanted to come on. They wanted to talk about this issue. They wanted to try and explain what they thought was going wrong and also then possible solutions to it as well. Absolutely. There was no uh, unwillingness in stepping forward and coming onto the show. And I think that is because... We're at the 11th hour, aren't we? I mean, the salmon is in crisis. It has recently become an endangered species officially. People want to know what they can do. And people who have the information, uh, the tools at hand, are keen to share that information. We hope this podcast uh, helps helps link the audience with those solutions uh, in the salmon fight. And that is the key thing. Um, a lot of environmental issues, climate change issues, they're doom and gloom. You know, it can be glass half empty. This is not like that. There is a lot of kind of dangers, yes, that are going on, but we're also advocating solutions. We're trying to engage and inspire people who listen to kind of go, yeah, we can do something too. And that's a, a key message, I think, that has to come from this podcast. I think it's really important that we find out from all of these wonderful contributors how they can advise others um, who are sat on their couch at home or, or who are in positions of power. Um, what what people can be doing from home or otherwise to help save this wonderful species. And just on that, actually, as well as some people might go, well, look, there's so many other problems in terms of climate change and species that are in danger. You know, who cares about the salmon? It is the conduit between the oceans and the rivers, between salt water and fresh water. It's unique. Anadromous nature means that it is the barometer for both those environments. And we can learn so much from this fish if we save it. Speaking of solutions and the Atlantic salmon, uh, the first episode that we're going to cover on the series is focusing in on Iceland. We speak to Elva Fredriksson, who is the program director for North Atlantic Salmon Fund in Iceland. Elvar is a passionate salmon angler. He's also passionate about Icelandic environment and the community. And he sees what's going on in terms of the damage that fish farm escapees are doing and the danger it's doing to the wild salmon. Elvar talks to us about the protests. He explains how 1% of the population came out uh, in opposition to it. And he really delves into the how and the why, what it means so much to the Icelandic people and what's going on right now. Well, absolutely. We've got Elvar, who, who is going to champion the Icelandic cause for us. And we can certainly learn a lot from the Icelandics, uh, particularly when it comes to the salmon and, and in this case, aquaculture. We're, but joining Elvar, we also have the indomitable angler actor Jasper Pakkanen. Sounds like a Finnish Robson Green or Finnish Jim Murray. Yeah, it's better. I would be very grateful if I woke up one day and I was Jasper Packer and he's charming, he's talented, he's handsome, he's a consummate salmon angler. So yes, I'll take that comparison gladly. Thank you, Dara. Uh, he will be lending his wit, his charm, but above all, his incredible wealth and experience when it comes to all things Atlantic salmon. So I think it's time, Dara. I think let's send it. Let's hear about what's going on in Iceland from Elva and Jasper. Late. In August, there was um, there was a massive escape from a from a fish farm uh, in in the west fields of Iceland. A uh, fish farm owned by um, Arctic Fish, which is owned by Maui, uh, and 
the you know initially uh the response of the industry was oh you know there yes there is a tear in the net but we don't know if there was an escape and you know don't worry we've got a system set up um that makes sure that the wild salmon are protected um you know <laughs> based on nothing but that's what they said no but uh but then all of a sudden you know just a, a few days later we started seeing farmed salmon in rivers where they are absolutely not supposed to be and this was not just in the rivers right around the pens they started showing up you know 100 kilometers away then 200 and 300 and 400 uh and we had you know we dispatched teams of volunteers just to go check out the rivers and you know, try to get as many out as you can because you know this is happening in the fall this is shortly before spawning season it's the worst possible time uh and and these fish are fertile because otherwise they wouldn't be going up the rivers, right? That's kind of the point. Um, and, you know, to, to, to boil it down, um, we've caught almost 500 farmed salmon in Icelandic rivers this fall. And uh, the list is more than 50 rivers, some of them more than 400 kilometers away from the, from the net pens. And some of them, be- some of the best salmon rivers in the world. Um, so how big is the area where the particular farm in question, how big is that area with the pens that the escapees came from compared to the 400 kilometers or more that they've been found in? It's a, it's a fraction, you know, it's a, these are relatively small fjords um, in the West. Um, and, but in, in, in some of them you have, you know, 20 plus net pens. And in a single net pen, you can have, you know, between one and 200,000 fish, right? So, there's a lot of density in a in a small area, uh, but the thing is, I mean, fish have tails; they swim, you know. So if there are defined areas where, you know, authorities or the industry say, like, oh, you know, we want to make sure they don't go there, <laughs> I mean, those fish are not going to respect any man-made lines. And can I just clarify the ones that are being caught? Is that on rod and line, or is that including the ones that are being harpooned by the Norwegian spear gunners? Yeah, that, that that includes the fish that are being that have been caught by the Norwegian divers, um, Norwegian frogmen, as they have been reported on as the in the Icelandic media. But the you know, but that that's only a part of it. Uh, like the vast majority is rod and line, either you know people who have paid good money and traveled a long way to go fish these rivers, or by the teams of individuals and and you know of, of volunteers that have been going there, you know, to try to target these fish specifically. Elvar, can I ask you, because obviously there's been escapees before. Why is it different this time for the Icelandic people? This one happened when these fish were six to seven kilograms. The internal protocols and, and monitoring duties of the company were not followed. So they hadn't, re- they hadn't monitored that pen for 95 days. And they used this sort of equipment, lighting equipment, which essentially is supposed to prevent or at least delay uh, sexual maturity for these fish. That was not operational. So all of a sudden, all these fish escape. They're all big. They're really big fish. Uh, and they're all uh, sexually mature and, and ready to do their thing. It's also important to understand that a six to seven kilo fish in Iceland, in an Icelandic, small Icelandic river is a really massive fish. It's a, it's a big, big size salmon. So when these farm salmon swim up these little rivers, in a lot of those small salmon pools, they're going to be the the alpha male or the alpha female, uh, which makes it even more harmful when it comes to uh, you know when it comes to spawning and and conquering the uh, the, the biggest most important spawning beds and and areas. So somebody, I was just speaking with somebody, an expert who did not he wasn't specifically talking about this case, but he said that. And he's a salmon salmon professor in the, at the Helsinki University. He said that normally he would assume that these weaker farm salmon that are from the escape escapes the escapee fish get sort of overrun by the stronger wild salmon. That this would kind of be the normal rough assumption, but in this case, it can be the complete polar opposite because these salmon are mammoths in some of these small small salmon rivers, so they're going to be overrunning. The, uh, the wild fish. Even if they're farmed, because obviously we're led to believe that farm fish are genetically weaker, you know, horribly modified. But what you're saying is because of their size alone, because of their brute force, they're stronger 
individually when pitted against an Icelandic wildfish? I mean, they can be, and size certainly plays plays a role in this. So, I think it was surprising. Also, I spoke with uh, with Rabbi at Midfjarðarál in in Iceland, and he said that the assumption was that some of these farm fish can't like jump waterfalls and they won't make it that far up the river system. And it was complete polar opposite, the, the, the reality of it. So they were easily just skipping over, over relatively big waterfalls and, and, uh, and hauling ass, so to say, to the upper parts of the rivers. Why have the Icelandic people taken to the streets over this? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it, it's a lot of things, obviously. You know, this is, this is one... This is one event in uh, a, a just a series of of horrible events with this industry, and and what NGOs and 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 everybody you know in the know uh, have been saying for years now is you know okay here's what's going to happen you know once you start this industry up and you start to scale it you're going to have escapes which means genetic mixing of farm fish you're going to have big sea lice problems and you're going to have massive pollution and that's exactly what happened and and so the people have been seeing more and more of this and they're realizing like you know what like why the why the hell are we allowing this 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 is ridiculous um and and this escape what i think really sparked uh the people is is that you know this was not just something that somebody was warning about this was real you know farm salmon showing up in all of these major rivers and and in iceland there are there's 2250 farms uh that you know, on the rivers that depend on these salmon stocks for their income. So now it's not just, you know, us and, 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 you know, partners uh, in Iceland, like, like the Icelandic Wildlife Fund and the Association of River Owners. It's not just us warning about it anymore. This is actually happening. So the farmers, the people that own these rivers. Sorry, just to clarify, um, the farmers being the people that own these rivers. Farmers, as in arable farmers, who happen to have land that rivers go through, as opposed to fish farmers, just for clarity. Uh, exactly, they were the they were the ones that that you know p- pretty much said, okay, you know, stop. This is this has gone on long enough, and that momentum and and you know and everything that was building up resulted in a lot of these farmers, you know, coming to Reykjavik, you know, joining the NGOs, joining the environmentalists, joining just all the concerned citizens. In a public protest, how many people um, turned up for the protest? Uh, about three thousand people, which is, I gather, one percent of Iceland, give or take. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> Isn't that great? I mean, regardless of the size, to have such a strong, passionate uh, outpour when the pressure cooker finally gave, you must have been really proud and really felt emotional about that, both of you, because you both went, right? Jasper, you were there. I was there as well. Yeah, it was incredibly inspirational to see it and you know the number 3000 like you jim you said it's one percent of the population it really says something you know 3000 might not sound like a lot of people but it, when when you put it in perspective it's one percent of the population meaning there were people from all walks of life it wasn't just a bunch of you know salmon fishermen fly fishermen uh shouting it, there were any, anywhere from kindergarten age kids to 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 grandmas and grandpas and everything in between from all walks of life, people gathered up there. Uh, you could tell normal Icelanders who have never been on a on a salmon river who don't who are not interested in salmon fishing, but they're interested in Icelandic nature and and the state of the environment uh, showed up, and it was it was truly credible to see that. Um, was there anger? You know, we're Nordic, and uh, Nordic people are very subtle. Sometimes I wish we were a little, you know, more expressive when it comes to uh, showing emotion and, and things. You know, that applies to Finland, where I'm from. That applies to Iceland as well. But uh, you, the message was clear, and uh, and it the message was really heard. We're hearing. I mean, obviously it's early days, but we're hearing the parliament have listened, and they're seriously de- deliberating massive reformation and regulation across aquaculture, certainly in Iceland. Is it too early early to hope that that that's what's going to happen? It's not too early to hope for it. I mean, we we've been hoping for it for years now. <laughs> Going quickly back to you know what what Jasper was talking about, I, you know, I, there was a lot of anger because that it, the anger about what was happening is what you know sparked the protest. But the the general feeling at the protest was 
you know, this is terrible, but we need to move on and we need to, we need to change. There's hope for the future. You know, that, that's, that's kind of the vibe that I was getting because I mean, all the picket signs that, 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 that people were holding, um, you know, there were, there were so many of them which, which, which were saying, you know, that, that people want to protect the environment. They want to protect the wild salmon. Uh, so it's, it's not just everybody saying this is terrible. They're also, they're saying this is terrible, but if we change, we can still protect this, you know, but what we've seen since then is that, uh, seven members of parliament have, um, have put in a official statement, uh, that they want to ban the industry, like the consensus for the rest of parliament quite a lot of them are not maybe at the stage yet where they say they want to ban it but i think everyone agrees that this is completely unacceptable and there has to be a fundamental change in every aspect were the politicians taken by surprise by the outrage of the public from all the times i've covered fish farming salmon farming you know the, the you know the politicians generally you know back at whatever country i've kind of dealt with it and they kind of ignore the public reaction you know because it's never kind of burst through so because of this mass movement that suddenly appeared where the politicians like whoa okay okay we better take this seriously otherwise we'll lose our seats here yeah no i i would say so definitely you know, there have been a handful of politicians that are very pro-industry that have, you know, tried their very best to to minimize this whole event and and uh, the the impact that it has had. But in my opinion, they have been very unsuccessful in doing that because, you know, uh, opposition against this industry is growing every day, um, and it's not it's not just the protest. We we also. Um, you know, we make sure that there are very uh, frequent nationwide surveys performed on the matter, right? So we have very clear metrics and data showing that, you know, what what the what the people's opinion is, and you know, latest polls show that like sixty three point five percent of Icelanders are against this industry. So, you as an elected official, like how are how are you going to ignore that? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm seeing kind of similarities to kind of Iceland grasped the nettle that was the banking crisis back then they're grasping the nettle now that is the crisis that is salmon farming I, and i get the sense of once they do grasp it they will actually go ahead and do something about this i mean i, I very much hope so and and i i have the i have the same feeling in the in the sense and i think it, the tiny population helps obviously right you know it's uh it's it's fewer people you have to convince <laughs> but what what everyone in iceland realizes is that no matter what industry you're looking at, whether it's tourism, uh, fisheries, or you know, fish farming for that matter, everything that Iceland has is based on this clean image, right? It's 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 the untouched, pure Iceland, with a small population and and a, a conservation mindset. Now, do authorities in Iceland always act like that? No. But I think they realize, along with every other Icelanders, that, that, that if we don't have that image, we have nothing. So how, how are you going to maintain an image that this is such a pure, untouched place, while at the same time you're allowing an industry to just take over and pollute um, all of our rivers you know, that have 10,000 years of evolutionary history? Uh, and, and at the same time, you want to keep you know, increasing tourism and you know, get, get people over here? It just doesn't work. I mean, it's off-brand. It's really off-brand, isn't it, to have uh, an environmental disaster, which is which is what it was. Yes, but I'm interested. Uh, I know you've been out in Iceland making uh, making a film, which we can't wait to see. How does this make you feel? Well, I mean, first of all, like Elvar said, everybody knew that this was going to happen. It, it was just a matter of time. Um, it was bound to happen. So purely from so i'm making it for the listeners i'm making a documentary about salmon and salmon conservation basically basically a documentary explaining that this this incredible species is is about to go extinct if we don't act soon and uh from the sake of the documentary the timing could have not been better i mean it was the luckiest possible time just as you said we haven't finished uh shooting it just yet we're in the final stages of shooting and we could actually travel to Iceland to document this this protest, document everything that's happening there, and and have it be a part of the film. Because up until then, you know, we've got a bunch of talking heads, experts, researchers, activists, scientists, 
talking about the what if, and now we're actually going to be able to show what, you know, that the what if is not just the what if, but it actually happens and it happens all the time. And this, these are the other direct implications of it. This is the mayhem, the destruction it causes. This is the price, the, the nature, the environment, the salmon rivers, the salmon populations, the, the local farmers, the price every, everyone has to pay. Um, so for the sake of the documentary and the documentary's core message, it was a lucky timing. Obviously, I would have not wanted to see it happen, but since it was just a matter of time, it's better that, I suppose it was better that it happened now as opposed to a year and a half from now. Um, but, but what blows my mind, I mean, we were just speaking about it earlier, how Iceland takes action. Um, Iceland also has been a weird case in this whole picture because in this big picture of salmon farming and the spread of, of the Norwegian salmon farming around the world, because traditionally, when it comes to protecting its environment, Iceland has been the model citizen. Uh, you know, let's take an example from Icelandic horses. It's probably one of the most protected animals on the planet, um, be it given, okay, it's a domesticated animal, but still, um, if you take an Icelandic horse out of Iceland, you can never bring it back. And you can't bring any, any, anything into Iceland that would ever jeopardize this unique strain, this unique, genetically unique uh, strain of horses, the Icelandic horse. And uh, for a country that's gone so far in protecting something that's uniquely part of it, part of its environment, its nature, its culture, its history, to then allow these Norwegian mammoths, these multi-billion euro companies in a free-for-all um, kind of take what you want, um, take these fjords, do what you want, we don't care scenario is a bit mind-blowing. The fact that the Icelandic politicians allowed this to happen in the first place still makes me a little pessimistic about, you know, how much action are they really going to take when it comes to this salmon farming issue? And I guess the likes of Dara, who's a keen angler but hasn't had the chance for whatever reason to get to Iceland yet, the, the movie is going to showcase the beauty um, and the and the natural nature of the of the rivers in Iceland, uh, as well as the tragedy that was unfolding when you were there. The the visuals, I guess, the brutalistic visuals of Norwegian spear gunners going in and and taking out farm fish from these rivers. Sure, sure, and and the the whole, I mean, the whole film project started off as as really an ode to to my passion and love for for salmon fishing, for fly fishing for salmon. But during the process, it be became painfully clear that we can't make a film about the love of salmon fishing when these fish are about to, uh, you know, potentially go extinct. So what started off as a story about fly fishing is no longer a story about fly fishing. It's a story, it's a strictly an environmental environmental film that sort of has a fly fishing framework around it because, I mean, the reality is that, uh, that most, most fish researchers and scientists and activists and people who are invested one way or another in, in protecting these, these fisheries, this, this species come from a very passionate angling background, right? So, I mean, the, the sad reality of uh, uh, the environmental movement is that the fish are sort of like the losers of this this whole this whole big of the, of the big big picture because they're you know they're not furry and they're not co uh, cute and you don't wanna, you don't want to hold a hold a salmon and and pat it and cuddle it because it's cold and slimy. Um, so a lot of people don't really see protecting fish. Um, sexy or interesting because they're not cute. Uh, you don't relate to fish the same way you relate to other animals. This is because this is actually something we spoke about before, Jim. And we're all anglers. We're all salmon anglers here. But people will say to us, but hold on a sec, you're hooking the fish. You know, you're causing them pain. I suppose, I suppose in the ideal world, all nature would be protected for just the sake of protecting nature and making sure that, that we leave nature as it is or even in a better shape to future generations. But the reality is that we have this, this passion. You know, people have been fishing for thousands and thousands of years. Um, nowadays, people don't really need to fish for, 
for other than recreational purposes when it comes to, uh, you know, recreational angling, you, me, or anybody else going fishing. Obviously, there's commercial fishing that provides food on people's tables, but but we don't really need to fish to feed ourselves or to survive in this world. Fishing, however, is not going anywhere. Uh, fishing will always be this primitive passion, primitive urge and instinct that people have. They want to go fishing. It's a way to relax. It's a way to spend time in, in nature. Um, and obviously, catching a fish is, is, is a part of that process. We, um, anglers, um, when especially the ones who are concerned about the, uh, the state of our fisheries, want to do things the right way, we cause as little harm as possible to these fish. We're also pretty much the only ones who protect these fish. So a lot of times I'm, I, I use an example of, of safari tourism in Africa. If we didn't have filthy rich people flying with their fancy cameras down to Africa, the big five wouldn't be there anymore. There wouldn't be lions or, or rhinos or elephants. They'd all be hunted down and killed and all of them would be extinct by now. Um, we need financial reasons to protect these animals. That's the, that's the reality of things. That's the, that's the sad truth. Um, again, in an ideal world, that wouldn't be the case. But when there's a financial incentive to protect these, these, these species like salmon, then the protection actually happens. When there is no financial reason to do that, these, these rivers would be, would be dead by now. And that's very evident in places, remote places like the Kola Peninsula in Russia, where the only rivers that actually have fish are the rivers where, where you have a salmon fishing camp and people fly there with a helicopter to fish for a week, pay big bucks to, uh, to catch a salmon, and then go back home. All the rivers that don't have an established fishing camp are basically poached to, uh, to, to death. There's, there's not a single salmon left in these, these rivers. So when humans don't have the financial incentive to, to protect the species, that protection is not going to happen. It's a brilliant analogy to put it in parallel with the safaris. And I think the bottom line is wild fish need anglers. Without anglers, there are no wild fish. And uh, that's never been the case as much as it is now. And I think it especially applies to the to the wild Atlantic salmon. I think, yes, but just listening to you talk about fishing there and putting it in some sort of financial terms, obviously it goes way beyond that, doesn't it? This primeval visceral connection that we have with catching or hunting a fish, a wild fish, a wild animal. But at least with a fish, we can do it pretty harmlessly and release it. That's a kind of spiritual thing, right? I'd like to hear a little bit first from you, Jasper, and then you, Elvar, if that's okay about that side of things. What is it in your soul that takes you to the river? I mean, my, my mom and dad tell me that I started fishing passionately before I was two years old. So they, they were on a lake and, uh, and you know, somebody taught me how to, how to use a little pole with a line and a worm in a in a hook and i caught a couple of small perch and was so mesmerized by that experience that when we got home the only thing i wanted to do according to my mom and dad was to fish um from the kitchen sink or from the toilet bowl or a little puddle out on the out on the uh, on the street with my mom's you know sewing tray and uh and when i think of that as an adult i mean the only explanation I can think of is the fact that fishing, hunting, the hunter-gatherer instincts are so deeply rooted in us, in our DNA, in our backbone. Um, and for some people, these, these primitive urges just pop up in a stronger way than, than for our, others. You know, be, be the hunter part or the gatherer part. I can't think of any other reason why a less than two-year-old kid would, you know, have a spiritual awakening sort of and, and realize that this is the this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is my biggest passion. And it has been ever since for me, ever since ever since then. Yeah, and it's it's buried deep in the amygdala, isn't it? It's something that's inexplicable, but yet there is a spiritual side. And it's that subconscious I don't want to get too bogged down into the philosophy of it all, but yes, there there's that urge to catch something. 
And there's also, as you know, perhaps some of the audience who might not be fly fishermen know that there's something about the way we try and catch these salmon that is a little different, perhaps, than other styles of fishing. There's something about fly fishing for salmon that's so beautiful, so poetic. There's just something about that particular fish, the Atlantic salmon, the wild Atlantic salmon and fly fishing that is a perfect combination. Right? Yeah. It, it's also an evolution. Like, you know, the two-year-old kid that I was was just mesmerized by, by catching a fish and the 10-year-old little Jasper was mesmerized by the idea of catching a fish and being able to kill it and then eat it and be proud about like feeding the family. My family was eating the fish that I caught. Then the 15 year old me was starting to doubt uh, the idea of killing these fish because I liked them too much. I, I, I felt too deeply about them. And by the time I was 18 or 20, the, the thought of, of killing one of these fish was almost impossible for me because because that that this fish is the reason why I'm you know why I'm so passionate about traveling near and far, spending weeks uh, in nature, dreaming of catching this one fish, and then when I catch it, it would be like the anticlimax of the century to to kill it and gut it and eat it. Um, and eventually, I reached a point where I kind of find myself doubting whether or not I should be fishing at all, or if I should be just sitting by the riverbank and, and, you know, watching this amazing river and, and, and enjoying nature from, from that perspective. And is that maybe the direction we're heading? And people who go on safari or people that go stalking, uh, traditionally going to shoot the stags. Now there's a big market that they just go and they take photo, take a photo and that's enough. And, and, and that's what I was and trying to get at, Jim. Yeah, because I, I wonder that, like, I, I've spoken to about this in Gillies in Ireland. They reckon in 50 years' time, fishing could nearly be banned, you know, as a recreational sport. Um, and do we get, but then it comes back to, isn't it? It's the tug is the drug, as they say. You know, and I I have friends who play golf. You know, they can't understand why I go fishing. They literally think, so you stand in a river and nothing happens for most of the day, like... I've got to say, in, in my mind, you know, what you're doing when you're when you're salmon fishing or just, you know, fly fishing in general is that you are you're in like very active dialogue with something much greater than you, which is your environment uh, and the river and salmon. And. And and you, you, ha you have to be strategic about it. Right. So you are constantly in your in your head making, you know, you're, you're trying to read the environment, right? You try to read the water. You're trying to, you know, you, you, you're subconsciously you know, aware of every factor of the weather, every fa factor of your surroundings. And then you make some sort of an assumption or, or, or some sort of a plan. And, and, and that is how you fish. And if you get a response from the environment, whether it's a fish boiling at your fly or, or the tug, it's, it's just one of those primal rewarding feelings that like, I, I agree, I can't describe it, but I'm, I'm starting to look at it more and more as, as an active dialogue with the environment if that makes sense to explain know. that more ever that's really interesting i mean we, we've all been salmon fishing right we we know if um you know if if the water is low the fish are going to hold in you know tighter spots where there's more oxygen because there's faster water if the water rises they will move out of those spots and they'll, and they'll, they'll seek comfort you know uh they'll, they'll, they'll go into those comfortable spots um there's a there's a certain light because the sun is setting behind that mountain, you know, which might affect your uh, choice of flies. Um, there is, I don't know, you know, air, air pressure, all, all these kinds of things. And, and you know, you're, and you're, you're constantly reevaluating your strategy and, and, and what you're doing in that environment. So, so in my mind, that feels like a very active conversation. And, and hopefully the result of that conversation is, is getting to engage with the salmon, whether, whether it's just a, a fish chasing your fly or you're actually hooking it, it's just, it's just this unbelievable thing. I've never thought of it like that, actually. That's, yeah. I mean, I remember when I first started salmon fishing, the size of the river suddenly, compared to the trout streams I was used to and the rods and the tackle and the people, it's heavy stuff. It's big stuff. Tell me, Jasper, if we're sticking on Iceland for a bit, uh, just to follow up from Alba there, he spoke so beautifully about fishing. Tell us some of the highlights that you've had in that wonderful country. 
Iceland has taught me not necessarily more than any other place, but certainly it's up there because the Icelandic salmon fishing in these very small streams uh, that you could barely imagine salmon swimming up. You're fishing on, with techniques that that kind of make you think of salmon fishing in a whole new light. I mean, these micro size 16, sometimes size 18 little micro flies that you're fishing for salmon. Um, I the first time I fished Iceland wasn't was a real eye opener, and I've then taken those those techniques to other rivers in Norway and Russia when Russia was still accessible um, with great success. But and 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 people are baffled when they see you do, doing something like that because it's just you know it's the same kind of thing when you when you actually catch your first. Atlantic salmon on a dead drifted dry fly. You know, you you've known, you've heard that it works, and uh, but it, it's until the f- moment when you actually catch your first salmon on a dead drifted dry fly, that whole thing is like a completely absurd, bizarre idea. And then when that first time happens, you understand, oh, this is how it works, and then everything's clear, and you've discovered this whole new side of salmon fishing you've you know you've unlocked this box of treasures and uh and a whole new level magical level of salmon fishing is is presented to you the same happened with me with uh with fishing these micro sized little flies stripping them as fast as you can and uh and you know getting reactions and you know a, a lot of times it's the most effective way to to fish outside of iceland as well when the when the conditions are right that's what's so infuriating but also so magical about salmon fishing because just when you think you got it nailed the rug is pulled someone else next to you or down river is catching more fish and doing the polar opposite right it's such a great thing that drives you to you know to to go further right and and you know obviously get better but also just you know broaden your horizon and your understanding of all this and you know, like if we're talking about like all the all the micro tubes and all the micro flies, um, you know, a couple of strands of hair or or a slight change in color, but the exact same pattern could be the deciding factor. And you don't know why, but you really want to know why. All yeah, right, one minute you're, you're confident, the next minute your confidence is knocked off its perch, and I think that emotional roller coaster of of, of fishing is is what's really exciting. I want to say one thing uh, to to confirm Jasper's point here. I, th- I think I'm, I'm th- I think I got this right. So September eighth, two thousand eighteen, spawning pool on the Hunt River in Labrador. My first salmon on a dead drift to dead uh, dry fly. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember it to the fucking day. Like, <laughs> have you ever caught one on the dead drift to dry fly, Jim? I've never. Yeah, I have, but only in Iceland, uh, and it was uh, I was on the Mid Federal. Rappi's mid up there in the up, up there in the canyons. I'm sorry, Dara. I'm sorry. One day, one day we will take you. Jasper, what was your highlight from Iceland? If you were to pick a favorite um, salmon, must must have been the first one I caught. Uh, caught in Iceland. Um, we were in uh, in a river called Rutafjarðará. Got the got the chance to fish it for one day, and it's got a tributary running into it called Seekop. And that's that's where I caught my first Icelandic salmon. And it turns out I met um, the late um, Icelandic salmon hero, Orri Vitrusson, uh, later on. And he, and he caught his first ever salmon on a fly in that same exact pool, uh, same exact river, little little river, when he was young. That's a nice touch. And you knew Alva, you knew Ori personally, didn't you? I, I, actually, I, I knew Ori from when I was a kid. Um, I mean, my my parents are you know both very uh, avid anglers, and and uh, and my father especially was involved in a lot of uh, you know salmon projects. You know, he was he was chairman of the angling club of Reykjavik for a while when I was a kid, and he worked a lot with Ori on sort of the in the very early NASF days. Um, and you know, at that time, it was a really new concept <laughs> in the world. Let's raise a lot of money to save salmon. Uh, not a lot of people saying that at the time. Um, 
But so I was, I, you know, I, I always knew of the work that Artie was doing. And, and, and then um, when I was old enough to get a driver's license, uh, he immediately offered me a job uh, guiding on, uh, you know, some of his guests in Iceland. So I, I was there, you know, just fresh out of driver school, taking all these, uh, all these really experienced fishermen uh, on, especially the big Laxo up north, Laxo and Alda. Um, it's a terrifying river when you're when you're a kid. It's huge, and you're rowing boats all over it, you know. <laughs> but I, I I had the time of my life, and and um and after that, you know, he he, he kind of gave me the start, right? So after that, I was guiding a lot. Uh, then when I was in in university, I started doing sort of odd volunteer jobs for NASF, uh, whether we you know it was statistical analysis at some times, and uh you know sometimes just writing writing stuff for him, and 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 he always kept me in the loop and. And then in 2016, I, um, you know, it, it just, it, it became more and more frequent. And then in 2016, I, 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 I started having sort of weekly work sessions with Ori and, and, but then in, you know, in 2017, sadly, he, he, he passed away. Uh, so it was kind of left to us, you know, the, the core team around him to pick up the pieces and, and make sure we, we kept it going. He, I mean, he was an incredible, incredible man. And there's a big hole. I mean, no, it's a cliche and we've heard it a million times, but there is a big hole that's, that's been left in the, in, in the plight for the salmon. Um, Jasper, you, I know you work closely and, and, and are close and, and friends with, um, with the great Yvonne Chouinard. He's doing incredible things too, right? Yvonne is a very, very special human being. I mean, he, this, this guy, lives and breathes the ideology that shows that everybody knows the ethos Patagonia has, but there is not a single person on this planet who, who would, um, who would own that ideology more than he does. Um, just these like simple examples of him never having owned a cell phone. He doesn't have a, have an email address. Um, he, he still, all of the clothes that he has are from probably from the eighties and stitched up many times and fixed. And because he doesn't believe in, in buying anything new, which is the reason why he tries to build his clothes, Patagonia's clothes to last for a lifetime. And, uh, and then all of this combined then sort of culminated in the fact that he decided to donate his whole company worth $3 billion dollars to a nonprofit with the focus of saving the planet. Uh, I mean, name any other person on this planet who has done that. It's truly a unique case and truly hopefully elevates the whole, I mean, there's this billionaire's pledge, right? You, you guys know about this, how the, the, the ultra wealthy billionaires of the world, you know, the Bill Gates and the Zuckerbergs and, and so on have pledged to donate the vast majority of their uh, of their possessions to charities before they die. But I mean, Yvonne just took it to another level. He just gave away everything, basically. Obviously, he's made a living and he lives a comfortable life, but he's also a person who doesn't need money. When you see him, you truly understand that he doesn't appreciate wealth and, and money and being rich. Um, he actually feels very uncomfortable with it, and and these are no secrets. He's spoken about this openly, but um, but he, he is one of the most interesting, fascinating, inspiring people I've ever had the pleasure to meet, and and uh, especially the pleasure to uh to fish with. We've fished together in in various locations, and he's also part of the documentary on film. Well, I, I hope it keeps rubbing off on you the way it sounds like he is because he, he, he does sound like a really, really special guy. So good for you. And Alva, the, the same question to you with regards to, to Ari there. Um, it, w what did you learn from him that perhaps you, you can, you can share with us? I, I think, you know, both Ori and, and Yvonne, they're, they're these, um, forces of nature, you know, like you don't, you don't meet a lot of people that are, that are, like that and, and and it's it's not an image and it's not a it, it it's not you know a, a carefully crafted pr strategy this is their very core you know 
Uh, and, th- and that's obviously why they, you know, have been able to make it to, to where they did. Um, but Ori, so, you know, I mean, since I was a kid, Ori was always the nicest, the nicest person you would meet. But when needed, absolutely fierce. You know, so he, I mean, he, 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 he was very inclusive to, to, to everybody, you know, around him. He, he wanted everybody to, to, you know, to know about the importance of salmon, to know about the importance of, of conservation. Uh, and he, he wanted people to experience it, you know, so he was very often, you know, inviting people from all over the world to, to, to join. And, and, and there are so many people that I've met since his passing that said, you know, like, I, I had no idea about any of this, but then I was invited by Ori. <laughs> and, and, you know, so he, 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 he kind of built an, an army of influential uh, people that could really help take his message and the, the, the need of conservation to a, to a whole new level. Uh, so what I've, what I learned from him was that, you know, if you, if you're very convinced about something, if you feel very strongly about something, um, then you know you, you you can that that can take you very very far. Um, and and I also learned that you know he, I also learned that that you know you you have to be you have to be smart obviously, and you have to be some sometimes almost um, you know aggressive in getting what you want because we are fighting the good fight here but we're fighting immense powers uh but you have to be very inclusive and you have to you know allow people to 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 get an understanding of what all this if 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 you expect them to protect it they have to somehow understand it first just to bring it back to the situation in iceland and you know ori and Yvonne are pioneers you know people ahead of their time and and sometimes when you're the pioneer it's the harder fight to fight because you're ahead of the pack and you're more likely to be cut down do you think, and I'll start with you, Jasper, do you think what we're seeing with the protests with Iceland, that there's a possible sea change here that we're seeing? And I don't mean just within Iceland. I mean, within kind of, could, it be, could there be a possible domino effect here in terms of the public's perception of salmon farming? Yeah, I mean, it's all adding up, not just the protests, but we just had a call with Elvan um, a few days ago. And I, I said to him, I thought that this, what happened to es- escape and the protest le- that that was as a result of the escape would be kind of like we've reached uh, the pinnacle of this situation. It didn't take that long for for uh, other pinnacles that we needed to reach. You know, there's a there's a recent case in Iceland where they they just slaughtered a million fish because they were so deeply eaten alive by by sea lice by parasites in these net pens that they had to slaughter a million salmon. Um, because they could no longer be served for human consumption or they would have survived much longer. And uh, there's a recent case in Norway where the Norwegian Food Authority, who does surprise visits, checkups on salmon farms, um, went to a specific salmon farm and found out that they had a slaughter boat vacuuming. So the way it works is you have these net pens, like Elvar said, you have 100,000 to 200,000 fish in a little little net cage. And, uh, and for those who don't know, the slaughter boat arrives and it's basically like this massive sized vacuum. They put in a plastic tube into the, uh, into the net pen and suck the salmon out. The boat automatically has a slaughtering system, kills the fish, they get taken to a processing plant, et cetera, et cetera. So this, the, the food authorities show up at this farm and there's a slaughter boat vacuuming these fish out of the net pen, but they find out that these fish were already dead. So they're, they're basically taking, happily taking fish that have been dead for who knows how long because of diseases and taking them to a processing plant to be filleted and vacuumed and served to people. And the food authority of Norway is saying that these fish were actually being taken to a, to a processing plant for human consumption. Imagine any other farming industry doing this, uh, filleting dead cows from the field or dead chickens uh, and serving them to, to humans. How are these people not in prison? Why is it like we, it's acceptable when it comes to 
fish farming, these conditions. But yet, you know, we know it's not, you know, they'd never get away with it on land. Why do politicians, the state and the people, why do we accept it when it's in the ocean? Because it happens under, under the surface, really don't feel the emotional connection to fish the same way we do, do to, to other, other animals. They're considered, um, when you talk about farming, fish are considered biomass. We don't count them as individual animals. You know, if you have a farm with, with, with a bunch of cows, it's 10,000 cows in this farm. Not measured in biomass of the cows. Fish are just biomass. So the way it's communicated um, already sets the tone. Um, they're just, you know, it's just biomass. To actually to ask the question that you asked me, I, I think that industry is sort of digging its grave deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and you, these things, these events are hap- happening back to back to back now. And at some point, and I think we're reaching that point, it's breaking the news barrier more and more often. You know, the, the big media's, media outlets are writing about it more and more. Um, it's also easier for activists to, to document these because it's never the industry who says, we're killing a million fish, we're slaughtering them because they're too eaten alive by parasites. It's not the industry that said we, we're slaughtering dead fish disease dead fish and vacuuming them and serving it to, uh, to humans, it's always somebody else exposing the, the industry. And with things such as GoPros and activists going into these cages and flying drones over these, these salmon farms, exposing what's happening in these farms, it's making it more open and uh, people become basically become aware of, of this dirty industry and, and all, the, all the tricks uh, they're trying to pull off. And uh, and I think we're reaching the tipping point. I think we're close to the big public sort of understanding and realizing how dirty this industry really is and whether or not they should ever even consider eating farm salmon um, ever again. Let's assume for a minute that we get what we want and, and we get these pens out of the water um, and, you know, that we have a breather and we go, right, what's next? Keeping it in Iceland, the super trawlers. What's going out in the going going on in the ocean to to both the the outgoing smolt and the returning um, wintered fish? You know, there's a, there's more than a strong possibility that we're losing generations of rivers to to super trawlers as a bycatch, and that's something that is we're only just scratching the surface because it's very difficult, obviously, to document. Would you, do you agree that um, Alva? First to you, do you agree that this is an area? This is one of the likely suspects that needs a lot more attention and a lot more investment and a, and a lot more work and research uh, in, in the fight for our salmon. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And um, like you said, it's difficult to monitor because most of the time, any kind of bycatch is it's it stays as undocumented bycatch, right? So I think there needs to be a fundamental change on, you know, coming from the authorities that, that you know, if this does happen, uh, that it is reported every single time. And, and salmon as a species is reaching that, that, uh, that place where it's, it's starting to be about every fish, right? So, so yes, I do think it's, uh, it's a problem. Uh, we, we definitely, we need better access to the data. And I think the actual logging off the data needs to be more tight as well. Well, Jasper, if you had a billion euros to help the plight of the wild Atlantic salmon, what would you spend it on? Um, I would buy a bunch of hydropower, strategic hydropower dams and, and just remove them. It's, it's the most effi- cost-effective, efficient way to, to revive salmon rivers that once were great. We have a great example in, in Finland, this river Hiitolanjoki, that runs into a uh, onto the Russian side and, uh, and, and is home to critically endangered salmon. And we were able through campaigning, multiple different people and different organizations have been campaigning to get these dams removed. Um, the government of Finland, together with private donors and, uh, and regional local funding, were able to purchase these three dams, active hydropower plants. And the last one of these three was removed about a month ago. But what was incredible was that the first one was removed um, a couple of years ago. And while the machinery, while the tractors 
were in the riverbed removing this dam, these critically endangered salmon who have never been in, in the last hundred years above that dam were swimming um, with the tractors trying to find their way through these little cracks that they were exposing in the dam up to these new new or old spawning beds that were hidden on, um, behind the dam. And, uh, and they made, when they did the uh, electrical fishing, count, basically counting little par juvenile salmon after the, uh, after the first spawn, they set the new Finnish record in the amount of fish um, in, these, in these, you know, sample areas. So that just goes to show how quickly nature rebounds if you give it a, a chance. And removing existing dams, existing hydropower, taking down the dams is by far the most cost-effective way to, to revive these, these, these salmon populations. Sorry, just to ask, because I know in, in certainly in other parts of Europe, these dams, a lot of them are, are, are not used anymore, right? They're, they're, they're historic. They're relics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of, a lot of dams are, they, they play no role in the, uh, literally no role. I mean, most, most dams nowadays are completely obsolete. They, they're not needed anymore. Um, out of the thousands and thousands of dams in Finland, for example, a handful actually play a role in, in energy production. You could, you could, if you left 50 dams and removed moved all the rest of the thousands of dams, it would have a very marginal, if no real effect on producing energy. So when people think about removing dams, they often confuse that with the idea of, you know, needing renewable energy and, and why are we renew, removing something that is needed on this on this planet. Um, but the fact is, most of these dams don't play, you know, they're not needed anymore. They used to be back the days when they were built in the 60s, you know, one of these small dams provided much needed local energy. Um, nowadays, you can replace even these medium sized dams with one modern wind windmill. Um, that's how that's how insignificant they are in their energy production. So the short answer is, I would buy a bunch of hydropower plants in Finland, in Norway, in other countries, and take down these dams and 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 let the rivers do their do their job. Let the fish return and and have thriving fisheries in in very short period of time. And Elvar, yeah, um, I, I I would spend most of that money uh, towards uh, eliminating fish farming. That's just, that's you know we just we 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 we're, we're seeing it firsthand now how you know, just how quickly things can, can go really wrong. Um, and, and that's damage that's irreversible. So I would, I would, I would use most of that money to fight the fish farming industry, but then I would, uh, use a lot of it too, to, to do, you know, what, what you could say are traditional NASF projects, which is going straight to the source and buying up, whether it's like Jasper is saying, you know, hydro plants or, or unsustainable fisheries, basically using private funds asking people, you know, recognizing people's rights in every way, but asking them, please, you know, do not do this and I'll compensate you fairly and let the, the river and the environment just take over. Great answer too. Um, to follow up, uh, Jasper, and now you've got no money. And, you know, in the, in, 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 in the real world, uh, what, what can people do at home um, from their couch or whatever um, to, to help the cause? Social media has great power and, I've seen it in Finland through through campaigning over social media. When you when you spread the message and you encourage others to to spread the message on social media, once you reach um, sort of a critical mass with this message, the politicians start listening. And Finland went from being being in the on the literally in a dinosaur age when it came to protecting our fisheries. Everything was backwards. Everything was, you know, a relic from old times. Our fisheries have, have, have been devastated by irresponsible fishing practices, fishing politics. And through campaigning on social media, which costs nothing, uh, basically just people taking a stance, standing up for what they think is right, bombarding the politicians with questions, with, with requests for doing the right thing. Little by little, that boat started turning, and Finland went from being um, something that that I was pretty ashamed of to 
to to being something I'm pretty proud of in a very short period of time. Um, and now is, for example, leading the way in Europe with with removing more dams and more significant, more important dam removals than almost any any other country in Europe. This is all because of social media campaigning. This is all because of normal things. Uh, kind of took to the streets in a modern way, took to the to the pages of social media, Facebook, other other outlets, and and got their voices heard, and and eventually the politicians listened. Social media, that's great. That's great. What what about you, Ava? Yeah, I mean, I would I would absolutely agree with Jasper's point on social media. Um, I mean, it's it's of course up to us who are who are trying to implement the change to make it easy for people. Um, you know, to, to do something right, because you can't expect everyone to really go out of the way um, to do something like this. But but social media has the power of of creating you know calls to actions and 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 things that people can do, uh, and they can do it in a matter of seconds, and they can do it from their couch or where, wherever they are. So that's a that's a huge factor. Uh, and I would say, secondly. Uh, People, people need to just change their consumer behavior when it comes to salmon. Uh, I mean, this whole industry is built upon the notion that they are, well, that's what they claim, that they are feeding a hungry world. And, and that's, just, that's just not true. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking you know, cheap um, fish protein from third world countries and turning it into uh, feed for a luxury protein that's being you know, produced in Iceland and more countries, which most of the world can't afford, right? So you as a consumer, you need to, you know, you, you need to just make up your mind. And, and if you care about the salmon and if you care about the environment, do not eat salmon from open net pens. It's as easy as that. And, and, and if, if, there's, if there's no demand, there will be no supply. That's such a good point. And there was something you said earlier, Yasser, when you were talking about Yvonne, about, you know, not needing new things, you know, and it's the consumerist mindset that, uh, our culture is kind of driven on, you know, Black Friday, all these kind of things. And it ties in with your points, Elvar. Salmon farming only makes up 5% of the global aquaculture industry. And it's, like you said, Elvar, it's sucking resources from the other countries around the world in terms of their aquaculture that they need. And it's going towards paying for this middle class affectation, I think is the best word I can come with, our love of sushi and our, you know, we've been sold a pup essentially that the middle classes think they need. And if we start enlightening them and educating them on this, the reality is, you know, something actually a lot different. And I think that hopefully will make a difference. Just to counter that a little bit. Please do. I learned it, friend. <laughs> um, you've also sadly now got salmon being, you know, the food for the, for, for, for the poor. Certainly in the UK, people um, people that can't afford, you know, pro it's the cheapest form of protein. You can go into a supermarket and and spend a, like a couple of quid on 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 a salmon on a one of the you know shittier salmon fillets. But you do that, you know, you got a, a, a family of six living living on top of each other in in, in social housing, and and that goes a, a long way for, to 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 get your protein count because of the marketing behind it. Obviously, it's it's cheap protein. So you're absolutely right. It's I think the lion's share is probably the the sushis of the world and the smoked salmon and the, all that nonsense. But but sadly, they've now they've now got a, a big market in 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 in, in the in the poorer um, people, which it, which is a tough one to to unsell. Do you know what I mean? It's very, very it's it's like cheap um, ca cheap beef, cheap mints. We you know British farmers can't compete with imported uh, beef because because the way it's farmed over in I don't know South America for the sake of example, where we get a lot of our beef from is ethically we'd never get away with it over here. We it wouldn't it wouldn't pass muster. So. People buy that crap instead of instead of the good stuff, and it's the same with the salmon. So, it's a re it's a tricky one, right? There's always a counter. Some some are weaker than others, but I think it, it crosses classes certainly on on the consumers. Jim, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, it a, a compliment that we can give the salmon farming industry is that they have done an incredible job in terms of marketing in the last forty years, and that's all it is, right? I mean, there was no salmon in sushi until the 1980s. It's it's a it's a need that is created by the industry, right? 
So that can be undone. Is it tricky? Yes, absolutely. It's tricky. But, uh, but I, I really do feel that, that there's, that there's an awakening going on. People are becoming more informed, uh, more educated on the topic and people are starting to care more because it's not just about the, you know, the wild salmon, even though that's where all of us here are coming from, you know, people, people should care about salmon farming because they use pesticides that pollute the fjords and, and kill other crustaceans because they use copper oxide on their pens because they kill the seabeds and the ecosystems around them uh, because all of their waste goes unfiltered into the ocean and they don't, they don't even have to pay discharge fees. All that is something that people should care about, even if they don't give a damn about wild salmon. Um, so is it tricky? Yes, absolutely. But is there, you know, is there enough bad things about this industry for everybody to care? Yes. Couldn't have put it better in terms of a summation of why people should care whether you're an angler or not. But we're all salmon anglers at the same time. Jasper, I'll start with you. What was the last salmon you caught? The last salmon I caught was uh, a, a, a 92 centimeter uh, henfish from northern Norway with uh, with a skated dry fly. Not dead drifted, not dead, dead drifted. It's different. <laughs> it's it's not quite as cool, but it's still pretty damn cool. Elvar, last salmon I caught was it was in uh, a river called Nordero in the west of Iceland, uh, in in one of my favorite pools called called Klatsbreda, Um and it was on a micro version of a sunray shadow. So basically, a sunray shadow tied on a micro tube. Was that your first fly over that pool, or, or did you did you resort to the sunray shadow once you'd exhausted your hitches and and your and your dress flies? Well, no. So this this was my second fly over the pool. Um, but keep in mind, this is you know this is 10, 12 millimeters in length total. You know, it's a tiny, tiny sunray. Uh, but I, I I rose that fish on another fly, and it didn't come again. So I switched to that one, and and he took that one. The tried and tested. I love it. Big fish. No, no, like 70, 70 centimeters. Don't get me wrong, great fish, but you know, I, I was kind of feeling bad after Jasper's story. So. <laughs> Final question. It's your last day on earth and you can fish anywhere you want in the world and there's fish in every river and you can fish who you want with. Where would you go and who would you take? Probably we would have to assume that that the regime in Russia had changed by then and and there was a new peaceful, peaceful leader in Russia, and travel was open, and you could go back to uh, back to the Kola Peninsula. I would probably go back to this little river called Sidorovka, which is a beautiful, crystal clear little river on the tundra on the uh, the northern side of uh, the Kola, and that's the river where I caught my first fish over a meter. It was a one hundred three, and that was actually on a dead drifted dry fly. Um, and, uh, that's, that's the, the river I would fish if it was the last day. It's beautiful. I mean, people fish these Northern, uh, Kola rivers, massive rivers, like, like Yokonga and, and the other world famous, some of the best river salmon rivers in the world, the ASR. Um, but there's some hidden gems in the Kola. And, you know, Sidorovka is one of these rivers where you don't get flown by helicopter. You fly there with a chopper that drops you off in a little tent tent camp, and uh, and then it's all hiking. So all you do is hike up and down the river and and uh, and just fish, 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 fish for 16 hours a day, 17 hours a day, sleep a little bit, fish some more, and uh, prime time salmon fishing, midnight sun, it's it's really truly unique, incredible up there. And I'm going to insist that you take my good friend Dara with you because he has been moaning Thank that you. he has not he has not been to Iceland and he is desperate to go. So please, 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 please take Dara. <laughs> I'll bring my equity card. <laughs> yes, bring your equity card. It's the only way they let you in. It's like a passport over there. And what about you, Alva? This is a tough one. Um, I, I've never fished in Russia, um, but I've. Everybody who who goes there, you know, says that these rivers are phenomenal. Uh, you know, from the rivers that I have fished, I think the one that I would spend my last day on Earth uh, would be Hofsø in the northeast of Iceland. And the reason for that is is that it's just 
it, you know, there's this cliche about that river, and a lot of people say that you know, uh, when when God sat down and he decided to design a fly fishing river, he made the hub cell, you know, because it's it's just it's seven beats, and no, it's actually six beats now. Sorry, six beats, and you you could effectively fish your whole way down the river, and you you just have this perfect this perfect swing the whole time. And that, that's not to say that there's no structural landscape this, there. I mean, there's unbelievable landscape there. But it's just every single pool is just perfect for fishing a single-handed rod and a floating line. And it just happens to be a really productive river too. Um, so I think I think I would probably say the Hofso. And I would go there with my uh, with my family. Uh, you know, we I, I really love fishing with my family. I'm, I'm lucky enough that everybody, everybody in my family really gets it, you know, so it's, there's, you don't need to convince everybody. Um, and, and my kids have gotten into it now as well. So I think a yeah, family trip to the Hofso. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been an honor and a privilege to um, talk to you uh, about this common passion of ours. And especially in light of what's unfolding in Iceland at the moment, I know that your time is very precious and certainly you're, you're needed um, on the battlefield. Uh, in Iceland so thank you very much thank you very much indeed thanks thanks a lot on the next episode of The Last Salmon QC Rolly Birkin aka DJ Mike Smash aka Paul Whitehouse and I met this guy and he was talking I couldn't understand the word he said we were sitting there like, yeah, I was down there, this actor chappy and he was talking to me and I was like yeah that was me <laughs> he said this actor chappy came in and caught all bloody fish an expert angler and author, the man behind the scenes of Mortimer and White House has gone fishing, John Bailey. It doesn't matter what you look at, whether it's the post office scandal or the scandal of losing salmon. And it's just about time that in this country we stopped sweeping inconvenient truths under carpets and actually started doing something. Listen and follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really appreciate any reviews and feedback that you can send us. And also keep up to date on Instagram at The Last Salmon. And remember to keep fighting for the Atlantic Salmon.